to this uh, professional lunch here at the Foreign Correspondents Club of Japan. I'm Anthony Rowley, a former president of the club and a candidate in the current elections. Um, to my right is our guest of honor today, who is, of course, um, Paul Sheard, the executive managing director, chief global economist, and head of global economics and research. That's quite a mouthful at uh, Standard & Poor's uh, rating services. Um, it really is a pleasure, genuinely, for me to be here to acting as moderator today because I've, I've known Paul Sheard for many years and I've developed great respect for his judgment and for the clarity and honesty and quality of his observations, and that is meant very sincerely. Um, I'm not an economist by profession myself, but after working for rather more years than I care to remember as a financial journalist, I can say that I've studied the... Um, the writings of hundreds, maybe thousands of economic analysts and uh, I've always been impressed by Paul Sheard's ability to go straight to the heart of the matter and explain it clearly to lesser mortals such as myself. Um, you've got a package today of various writings by Mr. Sheard and one of which is uh, a monograph called All You Need to Know About Abenomics and it's very short and to the point, uh, which is very nice. Really. One doesn't have to read too much to know all about abenomics. Um, there is one point he makes in this, and that is, I thought, is rather interesting. He says that the radical part of abenomics is that Mr. Abe and the new governor of the Bank of Japan have overturned the previous Bank of Japan orthodoxy that held ending deflation hostage to pursuing structural reform. As, as I see it, anyway, that, that is rather saying, you know, is abenomics a case of putting the horse before the cart or the cart before the horse? And this seems to me to, go, to be right on the ball, and it explains, I think, why Mr. Abbey is taking such a huge gamble, which could either prove the old Bank of Japan orthodoxy wrong, or see abenomics consigned to the dustbin of history. But I'll leave Mr. Shear to comment on matters like that. Um, I'm sure we're going to learn a lot today from his speech, which is entitled the Bank of Japan's reflation bid, why it should work, but why it could go wrong. Paul is currently the chief global economist, as I said, and head of global economics and research at Standard & Poor's, a position he assumed last June, June of last year. Prior to that, he acted as global chief economist and head of economic research at, oh, and also as global chief economist at, um, at um, Numerous Securities. Uh, I'm getting rather confused here. Let me start that again. Acted as Global Chief Economist and Head of Economic Research at Nomura Securities, and prior to that, he served as Asia Chief Economist and Global Chief Economist at Lehman Brothers and as Head of Japan Equity Investments at Bearing Asset Management. Sadly, neither of these two institutions, the latter institutions, exist any longer, but that doesn't detract from the prestige they once enjoyed. Um, among his many academic ac accomplishments, Paul Sheard has held faculty positions at the University of Osaka and at the Australian National University, as well as being a visiting, uh, as well as visiting positions at Stanford University and the Bank of Japan. He's um, been in Japan off and on um, between 1976 and the present for 17 years. He's been an avid uh, Bank of Japan watcher during that time. He served on a number of government committees under at least two prime ministers advising on structural reform and other issues. Okay, well, that's um, Mr. Sheard in a nutshell. Um, I want to um, ask you to welcome him, but before you, I do that, could you, I ask you to switch off your cell phones or put them on silent mode, please? So please join me in welcoming today's guest. Thank you very much, Anthony. I was told that a lectern would magically appear, and that's exactly what happened. So that, uh, that was quite impressive. I hope, hopefully, Abenomics is as impressive as that, uh, that was. So thank you very much, Anthony, for that uh, uh, introduction. I listening to it, hardly recognized myself. Um, and it, it really is a, a tremendous uh, pleasure and honor uh, to be up at this podium, uh, having seen so many distinguished uh, uh, luminaries over the years um, uh, addressing this uh, this group. So uh, this is really, I think, I'm here for a week, and this is definitely the highlight of my week in Japan, uh, kicking in the tires and uh, uh, trying to figure out what is going on. I have my own hypotheses about Abenomics and about uh, what I call Kurodonomics, 
uh, but uh, it's, it's great to be here. So uh, I think I've got about half an hour, so it's already the clock is ticking, so let me, let me jump in here uh, and, uh, and just make a, make a few points uh, and, and speak to the topic of why the reflation bid of the Bank of Japan should work. Uh, I think it's capable of working, but of course whether it will work or not uh, is, is a, a, an entirely different question. Uh, and I'm, I'm less sure about that uh, for reasons that I'll come to. But let me just start with um, Abenomics more, more generally, and just talk about that for a minute and then get into the monetary policy bit, because I do think the monetary policy, uh, the reflation, and when I use the word reflation, I'm using that in the sense of ending deflation. Uh, not going on a hyperinflation or anything like that, but ending deflation, I'll just say reflation. Um, but uh, Abenomics, and again, for those you know, people here living in Japan for many years, one of the things that you learn is the Japanese are very clever with words and terms. So Abenomics is a new uh, contribution to the English language. Uh, but as an economist, when I look at Abenomics, uh, what I see is really just conventional economics. This is a very conventional economic policy mix. Uh, what is unconventional is really Japan, and particularly a Japan that's been in deflation for 15 years, and this particular uh, policy mix now being applied to uh, deal with Japan's problems and challenges. Uh, I look at people, of course, talk about, or Mr. Abe talks about the three arrows, uh, but I really think the way to think as an economist about Abenomics is simply two policy thrusts. On the one hand, uh, it's a a determined bid to end deflation. On the other hand, it's also an attempt to raise real potential growth uh, in Japan. But what is uh, really significant here, I think, in this Abenomics agenda, uh, are, are two things that I would highlight. One is the uh, determination to end deflation. Deflation is not supposed to be the natural state uh, for an economy. Uh, that's why we have central banks. That's why central banks have so-called inflation targets and inflation targeting regimes. That's why central banks are given the job of maintaining what I would call operational price stability, which is usually about 2% measured inflation. But that's not what we've had in Japan for many, many years. So that's the strange kind of odd thing about the, uh, the Japanese economy. The second, and, and so the, the, the significant thing here really is while this is conventional economic policy, very aggressive monetary policy combined with a supportive a fiscal policy, uh, it hasn't really been tried in Japan before. Uh, and so that's the new bid. Uh, and the second thing which I think is very significant about uh, Abenomics is the, what I would call the delinking of the reflation agenda from the structural reform agenda. Abenomics, as I understand it, is essentially saying we, you know, we should do both of these things, uh, but uh, the Bank of Japan's job will be the deflation or the reflation part, and the government will deal with the structural reform part. Um, just to remind you of the, you know, the, the, the deflation in Japan, it really is, is quite a startling macro phenomenon. Uh, I was here from 1993 to 2006, so I kind of came at the beginning of the, the unwind of the bubble. Japan was really just slipping into deflation when I came back to Japan in 1993. And I sort of lived through the whole thing and, and left in 2006. Um, Japan was still in deflation. The banking system had been cleaned up, but Japan was still in deflation. But this is a very unusual macro phenomenon, particularly for a big economy like Japan. Uh, if you look at the CPI, for example, uh, and we're not talking about really m momentous deflation here, but the CPI in the last 10 years has averaged so the year-on-year -year monthly average minus 0.3%. So it's mild deflation. But central banks typically target about 2%. So there's about a, a, almost a 2.5% gap in the CPI each year. And that, of course, uh, compounds over time. Um, I like to look at the GDP deflator as well. This is not the, uh, the, the usual measure that the central bank targets, but it's the broadest measure of the uh, price level, essentially, of the goods and services that are produced in an economy. And it's really remarkable that in Japan, the GDP deflator peaked in the second quarter of 1994. And since then, has more or less fallen continuously and is down about 18.5% in those uh, 18 or 19 years, falling at about, well, actually about 1, 1.3% per year. 
Uh, if you look at, for example, the US GDP deflator in the same period, rather than falling 18% like Japan, it's risen 46%. So something like a 60% divergence in the overall price level in the economy. And that's reflected in nominal GDP. I could quote similar numbers. But it's also, in my view, a, a very key driver of the deterioration in the fiscal conditions in Japan. So I've always, in my analysis, uh, seen this chronic deflation as being the other side of the coin of the chronic fiscal deficits and mounting government debt. Now, what is so revolutionary about uh, Abenomics, or Kurodonomics in particular, let me coin that word, if it hasn't been coined already, what Mr. Kuroda is doing at the Bank of Japan, and of course chosen by Mr. Abe, so give Mr. Abe credit for that, uh, is, is, as you know, very, very different from what Mr. Shirakawa, uh, the previous governor, uh, was saying and doing. Uh, and I have to lay my cards on the table. I was very critical uh, of the Bank of Japan's policies under Governor Shirakawa, and even previous governors, but it really reached a crescendo uh, in, under Governor Shirakawa. Why is that? Well, the, under Governor Shirakawa, the Bank of Japan developed an, or, uh, call it an orthodoxy, which said that the cause of deflation in Japan is not inadequate, inadequate or insufficiently aggressive monetary policy. In other words, it's not our fault. The cause is declining real potential growth. In other words, to put it in economic terms, uh, inflation or deflation in Japan, at least today, is not, an, not a monetary phenomenon. It's really a real economy-driven phenomenon. Now, that's quite a heterodox theory uh, in economics. There's not many economists, at least outside Japan, that would subscribe to that theory. Uh, and because of that was the diagnosis, the cure, suggested cure by Governor Shirokawa was, in order to cure deflation, well, you have to reverse the cause. You have to raise real potential growth. How do you do that? You do that through structural reform. Whose job is that? Well, that's the government's job. So essentially the Bank of Japan, you might say, was sort of shunting the responsibility uh, for ending deflation to the government and saying you have to do that through structural reform. Yes, we will help as a central bank. We will we'll do various things with monetary policy and sort of support kind of from the sidelines, but the primary responsibility, the heavy lifting, has to be structural reform. So under Governor Sh Shirakawa's view, you still had the two elements, need to end deflation, definitely, you need to do structural reform, but that was the point that Anthony raised, that one ending deflation was being held hostage to the other uh, pursuing structural reform. Now, I argued uh, for many years um, uh, that this was a very self-defeating policy. One reason, obviously, if the Bank of Japan was saying, look, we, you know, monetary policy will not do it, then it follows that they wouldn't take the necessarily sufficiently aggressive action to actually end deflation. So you didn't see kurodonomics under Governor Shirakawa. So for example, uh, if you look at, let's put some numbers on this, aggressiveness of the monetary policy response. Once you hit the zero bound, a central bank, of course, has to switch to quantitative easing. What's that? That's expanding the balance sheet and trying to ease financial conditions by essentially buying assets and supplying bank reserves, central bank reserves in, in return. So under Governor Shirakawa, the Bank of Japan was doing a form of quantitative easing, but it was on a pretty small scale. So if you look, for example, the end of August 2008, when the financial crisis broke out, up until Governor Shirakawa stepped down, the Bank of Japan had expanded its balance sheet by about 50%. 50%. Now, admittedly, the, ba the Bank of Japan's balance sheet was bigger as a share of GDP to begin with, um, but that largely reflected the fact that Japanese have a lot of nichiginsatsu in their pockets. Japanese like cash. There's a lot of cash in circulation. But the, the better measure of how aggressive the central bank is with quantitative easing, if you want to measure this, is to look at how aggressively the central bank is expanding its balance sheet. That was 50%. Well, already the Bank of England was at 333% and the Fed was at 253% when Mr. Kuroda took over. So clearly in terms of the quantitative response, the Bank of Japan had not been aggressive prior to Governor Shirakawa. But it's even worse than that because what the modern theory of central banking uh, uh, tells you is that the, the, almost the key, the center point of monetary policy is the central bank 
acting on the public's expectations and trying to anchor the public's expectations of future inflation. That's what inflation targeting is all about. Now, you need more than words. You need action that makes those words credible, but it's those two uh, things together, a very clear, strong message, and then action which makes that message credible. Um, the problem with the central bank under, or Bank of Japan under Governor Shirokawa was that the Bank of Japan was sending the message, we cannot do it. So essentially it was validating the public's deflationary expectations rather than trying to dislodge them, overturn them and re-anchor them at a higher level. So no wonder that deflation went on in Japan because the Bank of Japan essentially validated deflationary expectations. But there was a kind of vicious circle because the longer that, that the Bank of Japan stuck with this policy, um, and the more that deflation, the, the longer that deflation continued, in some sense, the Bank of Japan itself was able to point to confirming evidence of, look, look how, uh, how, how, how sort of entrenched deflation is. Uh, no wonder we can't overcome it. So all of this has now changed with Mr. Kuroda. He's done a 180-degree turn, and this is, is the most important thing. I wrote a piece, uh, I think probably February maybe, saying, okay, what does the new leadership of the Bank of Japan have to do? And what I argued in that piece was to say the most important thing, otherwise it's game over, is the new governor has to completely change the messaging of the, of the Bank of Japan, has to come in and say, yes, we can do this, and yes, we will. And that's exactly what Mr. Kuroda has done. I'm not suggesting he listened to me. I'm sure he didn't. He's got better things to do. Um, but the point is, he's following, really, the uh, sort of monetary policy making 101 uh, rule book, but it hasn't been used in Japan uh, before. He then, of course, with the fourth of, so that was a very important starting point, send the different message. And again, when you think of consens consensus orientated, you think of, the, of Japan, you think of the sort of deference to authority, to your seniors, if you like, um, that was a pretty radical thing to do, to walk in the door and essentially throw Governor Shirakawa under a bus. But if the Bank of Japan is to have any hope uh, of actually succeeding, that's exactly what, what you need to do. Send that strong, confident, determined message. But of course, it has to be backed up by, uh, by action. Uh, otherwise, it's just cheap talk, and cheap talk will not work. That's actually a technical term in game theory that's used in economics, by the way, cheap talk. Uh, talk which is not backed up by action that makes that talk credible. So there we had the 4th of April uh, decision. Um, and I think I was the only person in the world that wasn't absolutely blown away. Um, but certainly everybody I talked to in the marketplace um, was very surprised and hats off to Mr. Kuroda. It was certainly uh, a very impressive uh, start. I won't run through everything that was announced. But it was essentially a simplification of the framework. The one bit that did surprise me a lot was a kind of ditching the asset purchase program, which was the center point of the comprehensive monetary easing framework that Governor Sh Shirokawa had installed. Of course, the asset purchase program was just a kind of labeling of assets that are on the balance sheet. It doesn't really matter what you call those assets. Um, but it was, it was an important part of the previous Bank of Japan's communication to talk about the asset purchase program. With a stroke of the pen, Governor Kuroda said, we're abolishing that. The assets are still there, of course. And then, of course, moving to a much more simplified framework of saying we're going to target the monetary base, double the monetary base by the end of 2014, double the duration of GGBs, uh, double the uh, purchase of ETFs, uh, and so on and so forth. But another very important uh, element in that 4th of April decision uh, was if you read the fine print, it wasn't just saying, okay, we're gonna try all this stuff uh, and do all this stuff by the end of 2014 and then sort of stop. Rather, the message was twofold. One is, look, this is, I'm determined to do this. I believe I can do it. This is what I'm gonna do. This is what, I'm, this is what I think will we'll do it. I'm gonna pre-announce the whole thing. But if it's not enough, we will keep going. So there is a whatever it takes kind of message in that announcement from the Bank of Japan. And again, that's really out of the playbook of monetary policy making. Uh, if this is not enough, don't worry, we'll do more because we are absolutely determined to achieve that goal of uh, ultimately 2% inflation. And of course, markets have moved uh, on that. Uh, we've seen the yen. That's the, the, the point 
to start the clock ticking here is not when Governor Kuroda took over, but rather when the market started to sense that something was happening in Japan. So really, between September and December, Mr Abe came in as the LDP president, then he became prime minister, uh, articulating his agenda, the Bank of Japan was the cornerstone, the market started to discount, aha, something's going on, the yen went from 75 against the dollar to over 100 at one point, it's backed up a little bit to 95, but that's still a big move. Topics went up almost 70%. Again, it's come down, uh, but it's still up probably 45, 50%. Haven't checked the numbers the last day or so, but still up quite a lot. And JGBs, which started around about 80 basis points, rallied to 40 basis points and came back to 80, 85 basis points. So they really haven't moved net, net very much. But the markets so far are very much on the side of, of, of the Bank of Japan. So that brings me to the, uh, the next question. Will it work? Now, probably if I stopped here, you'd say, well, this guy must believe it will work. He seems to like this stuff. Um, he's, he's sort of cheerleading the Bank of Japan. Uh, and as I said, for some, as someone who criticized the Bank of Japan for 15 years for not doing this kind of thing, you know, I have to really praise them a lot and, and, and certainly cheerlead and wish them well. Um, but so why am I still uh, sort of hedging my bets a little bit here? Why am I, I I'm not calling this and thumping the table and saying, you should believe this is going to happen? Well, one point is that while the Bank of Japan's actions under Governor Kuroda, are, they look pretty aggressive, and they are, they are aggressive, um, they're perhaps not as aggressive, calibrated, when you calibrate them, perhaps not aggressive as they appear at first sight. The first point to realize is that what the Bank of Japan is trying to do, I alluded to this before, the Bank of Japan, unlike the Fed or the, the ECB, the Bank of England, other central banks, is not taking aggressive action to protect its inflation target from slipping, to prevent disinflation or to prevent deflation, which is really what the, bank, the Fed has been doing in particular, it is trying to end a 15 to 18 year deflation. It's trying to get the economy out of deflation rather than keep it where it is. That essentially has never been done before. Uh, it's uh, uncharted territory and it's much, much harder to dig yourself out of a deflation hole than to stop yourself uh, dropping into it in the first place. I think what Mr. Kuroda is doing in Japan essentially uh, is analogous to what Mr. Volcker did in the late 70s, early 80s in the United States, except uh, Mr. Volcker was trying to slay the inflation dragon, Mr. Kuroda is trying to slay the deflation dragon. But so you know, Mr. Kuroda perhaps is trying to become to deflation what Mr. Volcker has gone down in the history books as being to inflation. But there's a little bit of an asymmetry there because it's actually, from a theoretical point of view, easier to rein in an inflation than it is to end a deflation. I use, as a metaphor, um, think of, of trying to rein in a galloping horse. You know, if you have strong enough reins and you pull hard enough, you can probably stop that horse galloping. Much harder to get a mule to run. Um, I'm not sure if that's the most appropriate analogy in the world, but you get the point. Uh, it's much harder to get people to move than it is to pull them back. The second reason why perhaps uh, things are not quite, uh, the Bank of Japan's not quite as, ag as aggressive, is I mentioned those balance sheet expansion numbers at uh, two points. One is, uh, if, if, so if the Bank of Japan implements everything that it's announced so far, the expansion of the balance sheet again, admittedly from a, from a bigger base to begin with, but the expansion of the balance sheet will be about 165% by the end of 2014. Uh, already the Fed is, because it keeps moving, is at 272% in terms of the expansion of its balance sheet. And as I mentioned, the Bank of England, which is, hasn't really changed very much recently, is 333%. So just in terms of sort of rate of expansion terms of the balance sheet, um, this is not actually, you know, kind of off the charts here. In fact, it's well below what we've already seen from the Fed and the Bank of England, even though those central banks are not trying to end deflation. The other point is that what the Bank of Japan is doing here is what I would call mainly plain vanilla quantitative easing. What a, that is, the main focus is buying JGBs. Now, admittedly, uh, the Bank of Japan is moving out the curve. It's extending the duration. This was a big criticism that particularly foreign economists had, um, why is the Bank of Japan buying J JGBs at the short end? If you want to get a bigger bang for your QE buck, 
then you really should move out the, the curve. And this fits in with the, the theory of quantitative easing. Let me just have a 30 second detour on that. The way to think about quantitative easing, one way to think about it, the way that I like to think about it is, is as a policy where the central bank is able to change the composition of the aggregate portfolio held by the private sector. So if we take the Fed, for example, the Fed has purchased more than $2 trillion of MBS and long-term uh, uh, treasury securities, and it's paid for those, it's taken those out of the portfolios of the private sector and paid with bank reserves, which is essentially overnight, very liquid central bank money. They're not perfect substitutes, and it's because they're not perfect substitutes that there's some portfolio rebalance effect. So if you're trying to maximize that portfolio balance effect of, of uh, quantitative easing, in theory, just from a pure theoretical point of view, what you'd like to do is sort of increase the distance uh, between the asset that you're supplying and the asset that you're buying. That is, buy assets which are least unlike the asset you're, you're supplying. So that would argue, if you really wanted to have bang for the buck, to buy, for example, risk assets such as corporate bonds, commercial paper, in Japan's case, say, JREITs, ETFs, for example. Now, the Bank of Japan is doing all of that. And again, hats off to them for doing that rather uh, unusual uh, thing. But it's on a very small scale. And again, if you look at the numbers that have been announced in April, by the end of 2014, those risk assets will be about 3.2% of the total balance sheet. So it's still a, a very small amount. Most of the assets will be JGBs and, and T-bills, a form of government debt. So one form of government debt is being switched for another form of government debt, consolidated government debt. Think of the, the central bank as being a part of the consolidated government. Now again, the two assets are not perfectly substitutes, but they're still sort of you know, at the zero bound in a kind of liquidity trap, fairly close substitutes. And therefore, that would lead you to believe that the quantitative easing effect would not be quite as potent. So, um, you know, maybe the Bank of Japan is, is still holding some of its ammunition, some of its powder dry here. Um, so that's another reason. Now, another reason, and, and this will be my, my final point, that I'm still a little bit skeptical about the whole thing. And, and let me now put uh, the Bank of Japan actions within the context of the, the, the Abenomics agenda. And, and I'm a little bit of a, a skeptical character by nature as well. Uh, is there's a sort of, a, there's, there's another narrative, there's another version of, of tr reality here. I was talking to Anthony before about Japan is all about peeling back the onion skins and see, you, you see, aha, there's something else underneath. Um, so one narrative, the conventional narrative, is simply that the penny dropped Somehow Mr. Abe got it that the central bank can end deflation, appointed Mr. Kuroda, and away you go. The other, the other narrative is a little bit more complicated, and it actually uh, links back to, to, let me make up another word here, which is the thesis that Abenomics is actually nothing more, or it is, an extension of Nodonomics. Wow, that's a mouthful. Noda's economics, Nodonomics. If somebody's going to invent the word abenomics, I will retaliate and invent nodonomics. What I mean by that is that the, the singular achievement of the Noda government, if you remember, was to pass the consumption tax uh, law in August of last year. And when you think about it, probably, well, the, probably the only reason that we now have abenomics and Prime Minister Abe is because uh, the Nod, Mr. Noda pushed that legislation through. Because in order to get the legislation through, he had to get the LDP on side, and the way of doing that was to essentially promise an early election, and that's how Mr. Abe got elected. And it may well be that we would not have had a Mr. Kuroda either, because if Mr. Noda had not called an early election, of course we'll never know this, um, it's not entirely clear that he would have necessarily chosen Mr. Kuroda as the, as, the, as the Bank of Japan governor. And even if he had, probably wouldn't have given him the kind of mandate and tailwind that Mr. Abe has given. So. What's all that, uh, what's, what's Abenomics got to do with Nodonomics? Well, the consumption tax law was passed in August, but uh, as you know, if you've, had the, if you've been a glutton for punishment and dug into that law, there is this conditionality clause. It's not uh, uh, a, an unconditional commitment to hike the consumption tax, but rather it says, well, w when it comes to the decision point, the government will look at the conditions in the economy and Importantly, we'll have to confirm 
that policies are in place that create the expectation that over the fiscal year 11 to 20, 10 year period, nominal GDP will be on average 3%. Real GDP will be on average 2%, and the difference is the GDP deflator, which will be 1%. In other words, while this is not an ironclad thing, the legislation says